in the in this webinar on opportunities for civil mechanical and electrical engineers in construction management sector the whole objective of this webin webinar is to create awareness about the opportunities available for civil mechanical and electrical engineers in construction management sector now i would like to introduce our speaker dr mahesh balasubramani sir he is currently working as an assistant professor in national institute of construction management and research hyderabad his area of interest is related to project organizing mega project management digital construction management circular construction infrastructure performance improvement in reference to his academics he pursued phd in civil engineering and mtech in construction technology and management from iit madras he has 3 years of work experience as former assistant manager with lnt construction now i would like to introduce our another speaker professor v vishnu nambodhi sir he is currently working as an assistant professor in national institute of construction management and research hyderabad his area of in research interest is related to energy systems and their optimization for built environments prior to joining a uh, nikma he has 4 years of industrial experience in the energy field in reference to his academics profile currently he is pursuing a phd in renewable energy at iit delhi he pursued mtech in energy system analysis and design from government engineering college kohi kodi uh kerala india in 2015 and also holds an undergraduate degree be in mechanical engineering from scat cet anna university chennai india in 2012 he contributed numerous publications in international journals in materials for energy applications now i kindly request our speakers to commence the session okay thank you logeshwari thank you over to you sir uh, the session is yours and uh, thank you very much uh, for giving this opportunity and uh, first and foremost uh, thanks to uh, ms kumuda who has been instrumental in organizing this webinar and uh, also to uh, vijay vignesh sir who has been very instrumental and helpful in uh, coordinating for this webinar and uh, so we'll start with this point okay and uh, i think most of the attendees should be from your final years in uh, civil engineering or uh, mechanical engineering or electrical engineering and uh, now you are very anxious about uh, opportunities and this is going to be the starting point and ending point in this uh, entire webinar it is not just purely going to be an opportunity we are going to tell you, you no know, uh, here are the opportunities uh, we are going to tell that okay but we are also going to tell how to access these uh, opportunities how you can skill yourself further and uh, access these uh, opportunities what are the recent advancements about what topics you need to gain knowledge so that you can uh, grab these opportunities okay what are the key bottlenecks so that's what we'll be discussing today and uh, so this uh, kind of uh, a, a title okay so it says that opportunities in construction management for uh, civil mechanical and electrical engineers so you'll be quite uh, confused right so you'll be asking me are you even sober okay construction is only for uh, civil engineers that's what is the typical uh, assumption okay but uh, the thing is that all the three disciplines are very very cr critical for the construction industry and name any industry okay name any industry uh, say is like the steel industry so if you take the steel industry okay the, the mechanical people are required you know that in steel it's uh, blast furnace is there center plant is there first is the center plant and then the blast furnace and uh, mechanical engineers are required not only for operations and maintenance but also for the construction for erection of these uh, centering equipment and blast furnace uh, equipment so we need mechanical engineers okay and we need civil engineers to construct the structures and uh, foundation for all these uh, equipment and we need electrical engineers to provide power supply and make sure of all the you know, electrical aspects of uh, these uh, projects okay so everyone has a scope here and uh, so who knows how to build the steel plants okay so it's uh, all these three people need to come together to build uh, this uh, steel plant or let's not take a industrial project let's take a very common project that you see every day okay what do you see when you enter a mall okay so who knows how to construct this mall Okay, with centralized air conditioning, it's not the civil structures alone that makes the mall, right? So whenever there's a huge power cut, 
um, so the huge park will be there on a saturday okay so blackout will be there so you'll be going to a mall or uh, somewhere to spend your time okay so there it this mall comes with a centralized air conditioning who knows how to build this centralized air conditioning you are mechanical engineers okay and it's not mall is not just air conditioning right you have uh, lighting you have power and uh, so that plays an important role as well electrical engineers are absolutely required to construct these uh, mall projects and take hydropower projects and uh, pumps and turbines should excite you right so uh, civil mechanical electrical engineers you must have all studied this uh, fluid mechanics uh, subject and today uh, largest uh, power plants we are uh, still building these uh, hydropower plants and uh, if you look at these hydropower plants it's not just uh, civil works that is there a lot of works is uh, you know civil in nature okay so a lot of concreting is involved in uh, this uh, you know dam construction and uh, but there is also electromechanical equipment you cannot produce power without this electromechanical uh, equipment okay so and uh, who knows how to build these uh, and erect uh, these electromechanical equipment it's the mechanical and electrical engineers we are, so we are building high speed rail so this is another instance okay people uh, because mechanical engineers and electrical engineers they are not quite aware that there are opportunities in this particular uh, sector at all we are building lot of metro rail projects high speed rail projects we are uh, building okay and uh, we know the involvement of civil engineers in building these structures in building tunnels in building viaducts we know that civil engineers are required for track work particularly okay only mechanical engineers will be employed for track construction they know welding techniques welding is involved in uh, track construction and uh, mechanical engineers understand these uh, better you cannot uh, you need to bend these tracks and there is also a limit uh, to which these tracks can be bent okay so because there is a limitation to your rolling stocks and uh, so the rolling stocks again uh, they are built by both mechanical and electrical engineers they play an important role in deciding uh, so how much the train can uh, bend and so on okay so in uh, track construction and what else do you see in metro rail okay there is an overhead traction system in some cases it's overhead traction in some cases this is a third, third rail uh, system okay so this work is being carried out by electrical engineers okay so who will keep this uh, train on track all these three engineers will make sure that this train is on track and uh, for particularly mechanical and electrical engineers so jcbs should turn you on right so uh, when we are uh, in our childhood we fancy these kind of equipment when there are some jcbs in operation we go and uh, see this uh, operation who knows how to you know manage these machines not operate so jcb operators are separate but you need to manage all these uh, machine okay so if this is your workplace won't you be thrilled okay your workplace will look like this you'll be surrounded by all these uh, heavy equipment okay and you will be required to manage this and why this needs to be managed okay because uh, the way the industry operates i'll give you an example okay if you say that uh, lnt owns this particular equipment and uh, they give that equipment to a particular site okay and this particular project manager in the site will not be motivated enough to utilize the equipment in a very optimal way he will definitely utilize the equipment because the equipment is there but a lot of idle time will be there okay and that's why these usage should be monitored so this plant and machinery is a separate department they have their own profits and losses and the equipment will be awarded on internal hire basis ihr it is called internal hire rate it is called on this basis it will be given to all the project sites so every hour okay the project site will need to bear the rent of this particular equipment even though the equipment will be owned by lnt still the project site should be should pay the rent for this and somebody should manage this right so wherever equipment is required they should uh, uh, demobilize from this particular site and mobilize to some other site so this should needs to be managed the operations and maintenance of these equipment should be managed so this is the kind of environment that you would like to be as mechanical and electrical engineers right so this uh, field has room for civil mechanical electrical engineers architects and non engineering graduates as well if you take construction industry only 50% of the people are engineers in construction industry remaining are commerce majorly another another 40% will be commerce graduates another 10% will be mbas and other uh, graduates okay and uh, what is uh, peculiar so how can you access these opportunities okay so i uh, i gave a pitch about this industry right so and you can google okay so uh, opportunities in construction management or project management you might find this interesting right and you find that every opportunity that you come across they are asking for at least one year experience 
so one at least one year experience they are asking and you must be frustrated as a fresher okay so i am as good as this one year experience guy or two year experience guy okay please provide me the training okay i can perform as good as this particular guy why do you want a one year experience guy or a two year experience guy that's your uh, question right and uh, another opportunity i'm just uh, showing you okay so it's in uh, it's for mep position like mep means mechanical electrical and plumbing engineers so this is where uh, bachelors uh, people with mechanical and electrical engineers they can contribute uh, here and what is the requirement here for this position they're telling that you need a basic understanding of the industry how the construction industry operates okay and they want you to have subject matter expertise in these aspects like in air conditioning in electrical aspects they want you to have an, an understanding already so without going to the field without entering the construction field it's not possible to have this but they still want the freshers to have an understanding of how the industry operates and become a subject matter expert in these aspects like mechanical works or electrical works and these companies already want you to have good verbal skills good communication skills okay so this gap is there okay industry wants this but you are not able to meet the requirements or you are frustrated that you don't get these opportunities but it's only available only for experienced uh, people okay so it looks like this uh, comedy scene of late actor vivek okay so as a fresher civil mechanical electrical fresher so this fresher walks into the office of a construction company and uh, he sees all these uh, advertisements asking only for experienced people okay and he is very frustrated he goes to the owner's cabin and he hands over this piece of paper saying that this is my resignation letter i am resigning my job okay and this owner is very confused who are you i have never even seen you in this company you are not even an employee here why are you giving me this resignation letter okay and this engineer is saying okay so then first give me a job then i'll resign okay so what is what are you thinking in your mind for all the opportunities you are asking one year experience or two year experience only if you give me a job i'll get this experience okay so like your chicken and egg story but what is this bad blood that uh, these construction companies have with freshers okay so there are two possible scenarios so one scenario is the case where uh, so in 2010 what used to happen is lnt used to come for mass recruitment they take a lot of civil mechanical electrical engineers and they didn't really mind about the attrition attrition rate at that point of time used to be you no know, uh, plenty okay so at least 30% attrition will be there that means that 1000 people join 300 people will resign and the company was not bothered at, at that point of time uh, because the situation was very different there was not much competition from other companies and uh, why people resign okay so these uh, engineers civil mechanical electrical engineers they join the job and they don't understand their role and prospects in the job they are uh, finding that in their curriculum okay, even for uh, civil engineers in their curriculum they have learned something but when they go to the site they find that okay for planning a software called microsoft project and primer as being used but in your planning subject in your uh, btech curriculum you might have learned about critical path method and pert and you will be wondering where this method will be applicable okay that method is not applied here at all so you'll be wondering about that and uh, you'll feel that uh, so companies like lnt they're using revit for 4d and 5d so you'll be thinking that uh, revit is only for 3d so revit is just meant for design representation okay but uh, companies are going behind that. and uh, so you need to have erp knowledge so a lot of these companies are working based on the erp system and you don't have this uh, knowledge at all and suddenly you are told that you know there is some uh, tendering department all the rates come from that particular department and there is a procurement department all the materials come from this particular department you are quite uh, confused okay so you to get a hang of this industry it takes about more than 2 years to get a hang of this industry but at this point of time you will be finding that your friends are comfortably working in all the it industry and all the training is being provided in a very structured manner by it industries but in this company this training is not available okay they expect you to learn all these softwares and techniques very very quickly and uh, so because of this you are very frustrated and you depart the company you resign from this job another scenario is that so btech civil mech and elect people join this uh, company and they find that even diploma people are working in the same company in your same designations and you won't feel valued and the company also will feel the same they'll uh, feel that even diploma people uh, do the same job as btech people let me take more diploma people okay so what is the solution for this and why this is uh, happening okay 
So, so the market is very, very competitive. Okay. If LNT is uh, bidding 1,499 crore, this is a true project. It's not hypothetical. Tata Projects Limited quoted 1,501 crore. Very, very competitive. Overheads are increasing. And construction companies would like to cut their cost. And they found that uh, because of uh, attrition, okay, they were losing a lot of money. That means that they are training you for one or two years and you leave the company and join some uh, softer company, not even a civil company. Okay. And uh, so this attrition is very high. Uh, but these companies, construction companies know that if GET stay for one or two years, you get a hang of this work. And uh, that's why they prefer one year experienced people or two year experienced people rather than fresh uh, people. Okay. And in order to cut their training exp uh, expenses, recruitment from campuses has come down. Instead, they only go off market nowadays and they recruit only experience one or two year experienced uh, people. So what is the expectation from this industry? They want you to be knowledgeable about this industry and they want you to be knowledgeable about the recent advances. So if it is uh, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, so what is the aspect that you need to know in your job? Electrical engineers, whether you know about building electrical works and mechanical engineers, so they want to gain knowledge on topics like uh, air conditioning, firefighting system, plumbing system. So this is not taught in your curriculum. Exactly. You might have a subject on refrigeration and air conditioning, but it's only from a very technical perspective, but not from a perspective of how these uh, ducts are constructed. Okay. How this air conditioning system is made in the mall and uh, so on. Okay. So that is what the companies look for. They want you to already have this knowledge of how this industry operates and they want you to understand your role in the industry and they want you to be cut out for the industry. Okay, and uh, today the kind of profiles that are coming, it's not just contract management profiles. So uh, that is particularly for civil engineers, right? So it's real estate valuation roles are available. That means the real estate companies, they want you to have knowledge about real estate development, real estate laws, construction laws, and uh, they want you to have marketing knowledge as well. They want you to have knowledge about property valuation and real estate valuation importantly. And absolutely they want freshers. So risk advisory roles are there. These companies, they want freshers, but these uh, freshers should have knowledge about risk management in prop projects. And uh, uh, beyond this, it's not just construction, right? Now, today, a lot of PPPs are coming. These are nothing but public-private partnerships. So you see a road and tolls are being collected from this road. Okay, so that is a public-private partnership. A lot of such projects are coming, right? And uh, so this uh, Chennai Tada uh, Tollway Limited is there, okay? Now, if you want to work for this particular company, so you should not just understand construction. You need to understand the business of building infrastructure and managing this. Okay. So this is the knowledge that these companies want you to gain as a fresher. Okay. And for this, the companies are not ready to make investments on you. So they want you to make investments on yourself. Okay. So how can you do that? Okay. So this is where Nikmar can help you. So finally, uh, perhaps the Vishnu is going to tell about how Nikmar can help you for about 10 or 15 uh, minutes. Okay. But, and you can look at uh, here. Okay. So you all read Quora. In Quora also, it's clearly mentioned that with the bachelor's in civil uh, or mechanical or electrical, your job will be site execution work okay, or quality related work and your growth won't be phenomenal. And if you take the construction industry today, okay, the project directors of huge projects like Metro Rail projects, in metro rail projects, it doesn't clearly say, okay, they're not very particular that the director's post should be taken only by civil engineer. Anybody can take that post. Okay. For a 8,000 crore project or 12,000 crore project, the salary of this project director is 2 crores. You can just check. Okay. And why is the salary very high? Because the project values is very high. Okay. You need to be very entrepreneurial. You need to manage this as a business. You need to bring profits to this particular business and you should not be corrupt. Okay, and that's why your salary is very, very high for these uh, positions. And we have seen our Nikmar alumni 10 year or 15 years down the line, they are become the uh, project directors. And uh, you can see here, okay, so even mechanical engineers, so they have a huge role. So this is like being said in Quora only, okay. And uh, in many cases, some companies don't differentiate between civil, mechanical, and electrical people. Okay. They are employed in project controls, contract management uh, roles in uh, some company. Okay. So that is how the industry operates today. And so why construction industry? So as mechanical, electrical engineers and other engineers, okay. So uh, as civil engineers also, so you have plenty of other options. 
you can get into environmental industry okay or you can get into uh, say geotechnical profile or some other profile okay construction industry is the second largest employer in india after agriculture is the second largest contributor to india's uh, gdp after agriculture and this is an evergreen sector there is never a recession to construction industry even after covid and all these things real estate is at the peak and construction industry is at the peak a lot of projects lot of government projects have been uh, uh, being introduced okay and it's a heavily service oriented field if this is the field that you are passionate about you are ready to commit to so this field will never fail you okay and when we think about construction projects it's only about say metro projects or road projects or building projects but it's much more than that india is doing a lot of uh, steel plants sintering plants and blast furnace plants we are doing and a uh, lot of road construction is happening a lot of airports are being built you have opportunities here a lot of hydropower plants are being built and even in mining projects all the three engineers are required okay so all these conveyor belts need to be built okay you can see it's uh, electromechanical and you also need civil knowledge for this all your engineering uh, mechanics knowledge will be applying here okay and uh, for constructing malls i told for constructing metros all three engineers are required for constructing any building okay all three works will be there and uh, so you have roles in um, oil and gas industry say for offshore your role will be there in construction management in pipeline construction your role will be there our process plants your role will be there for brisk construction or wind turbine construction today renewable energy is going in a very huge way okay solar uh, has become a separate business unit in companies like lnt okay because they realize that a lot of potential is uh, here they have created a separate division for that uh, you know, solar uh, power projects and uh, even within buildings there is something called fire protection system where mechanical engineers are involved there is plumbing system there is building electric uh, building electrical systems and uh, there is also safety department okay so with respect to health safety and environment there are two kinds of uh, roles so one is for all the projects you need to do environmental impact analysis and environmental management plans to manage the environmental risk in the projects for this we need knowledge about environmental uh, management okay so you have a role here so wherever all we are doing projects one side we are telling that lot of projects we are building right so there is a requirement for environmental management in these uh, projects and another is wherever projects are being done you need to manage the safety in these projects so for civil works okay uh, uh, a person with uh, civil knowledge in uh, safety department is there okay so in the safety department they also have mechanical and electrical people to manage the safety of mechanical and electrical works okay only for the safety purpose and there are other water and effluent treatment plants another beauty with uh, this safety roles is that the good opportunity is that so a lot of uh, people work for the construction side for the contractor side and then they begin to move to the client side like for safety in tata steel so they become safety engineers or safety managers in tata steel after working for the uh, construction side as a contractor safety professional okay and other projects power plant uh, factory construction projects petroleum complex projects we are saying and even after these projects are completed for facility management okay all the three engineers are required civil engineers mechanical engineers and electrical engineers are required for managing the facilities and in operations and maintenance of infrastructure assets there is a huge opportunity all these assets can't be just built and left off right so we as engineers we derive joy in pushing the boundaries of what is the largest biggest longest and tallest uh, infrastructure systems and what was the tallest building 20 years before is not the tallest building now So we are constantly pushing these boundaries and benchmarks. And uh, today, far technologies like bullet train uh, technology is coming. Okay, and in China they have gone for magnetic levitation trains. In US they have gone for hyperloop trains. Okay, so a lot of advancements are coming. So it, it's never a case that this sector is going to become saturated. Okay, and uh, so uh, flying taxis will come. That will require uh, a different kind of uh, infrastructure. We'll be building colonies in other planets. Okay, so again, there will be a market somewhere 50 years uh, down the line. So, what are the advancements in these uh, industries? Okay, so if you look at the recent advancement in this construction industries, so these advancements are triggered by the concurrent uh, challenges. And what are the challenges that we face in this uh, industry today? There are two broad challenges. One is sustainability related challenge. Another is challenge related to 
scale and complexity. So what are these sustainability related challenges? We have heard about uh, climate change and other uh, issues, right? So we need smart materials and uh, we need our buildings to operate in a better way. Okay, and research also says that buildings contribute to about 30% of the total energy consumption in the world. That is the highest uh, consumption by any sector. Okay, so we need to do something about this in terms of construction and in terms of operations and uh, maintenance also. And another complexity is related to scale and complexity. Okay, so what is the challenge here? We need to build things very, very fast. And that's why you have seen this uh, case in China also, right? When COVID was happening, China was able to build the hospitals in a span of just 10 days or 20 days. You saw all the videos where things are being done in the factory and they're just assembled at the site like Lego blocks. And uh, so for this, a lot of advancements are coming. The precast is an advancement. Okay. And we need to build metros, right? And these metros are not required for tomorrow. These were required yesterday. And to catch up with these delays, we need to build faster. And if you look at even the Pradhan Mandri Awas Yojana scheme, okay, and what is our progress in terms of housing for all in 2022, we have built only 50% of all these houses because there are challenges related to how we are building these uh, projects. Okay, so in response to these challenges, there are three kinds of advancements. One is advancements related to construction materials, another is advancements related to construction technology, and another is advancements related to project management uh, systems. And if you look at advancements in construction uh, materials, okay, so what are the advancements? So these, I told that these advancements are triggered by challenges, okay, and the challenges typically are like this, okay, so 7% of CO2 emissions occur from cement production. And this is very, very significant. So we are trying to find alternatives to cement. And sand is becoming an endangered resource. Okay, so government has put ban on mining of sand from all our river basins. So we need to find alternative materials here. And if you take M20 concrete, one cubic meter consumes 320 liters of water in manufacturing and curing. So we need to do something about water consumption in terms of uh, construction. Can we go for better materials or better techniques? where water consumption is uh, very, very less. And uh, corrosion losses from our buildings adds up to 5% of our GDP. Can we do something about our materials so that we can reduce this uh, corrosion losses? And uh, can your regular concrete be used for prefabricated construction and 3D printing? Okay, we, I told about uh, uh, China-like uh, practice, right? And there's also 3D printing in construction. Uh, the India's first 3D printed house is in Chennai. That's being constructed by a company called Fasta, okay? You can go and visit uh, the 3D printed house at any point of uh, time. It's there within uh, the campus of IIT Madras. And uh, so can your regular concrete be used for all these purposes? So these are the typical challenges. Okay? It's also related to scale and complexity. Because of scale and complexity challenges, I told that 3D printing or uh, precast is required. Okay. So in terms of alternatives to cement, I told that cement is... Uh, uh, contributing to 7% of our CO2 emissions, right? So we are trying to explore supplementary cementitious materials. And uh, one example is limestone calcined uh, cement clay. It's called LC3, okay? And uh, limestone calcined cement clay, uh, so clay cement is there. And uh, through this, so this is the website using which you can find the information on this particular uh, product. And Indian government has heavily invested in this uh, product. This is going to be a great game changer in uh, our country the important advantage is that through this material we are achieving 40 percent reduction in uh, clinker usual clinker uh, constitution you know in cement it's about 80 to 90 percent and instead of that we'll have five, 50, only 50 percent clinker and 30 percent will be ro low grade calcined clay and 15 percent will be raw limestone and five percent will be gypsum that is the constitution of uh, this uh, lc3 and 15 to 25 percent Substitution of uh, cement, we are trying to achieve using uh, these pozzolanas and a lot of Indian research is available in terms of uh, using fly ash or silica fume or uh, rice ash uh, or uh, sugarcane bagas ash as substitute for cement up to uh, 15 to 25 percent. And uh, we all know about admixtures or additives. Additives are materials that are added during manufacture of uh, cement. Admixtures are added during the mixing okay, of uh, cement or batching of uh, cement and um, when you are going to make the concrete. 
and uh, you have two kinds of admixtures mineral admixtures and uh, chemical admixtures and what are the purposes of these admixtures we are trying to make the concrete more workable so we use uh, plasticizers and in hot climate we need to um, again okay so we need to increase the setting time so that's uh, use retarders and in cold climate we use accelerators okay to accelerate uh, uh, the setting time to reduce the setting time and uh, we use rn training admixtures to increase the mechanical uh, strength we use bonding admixtures in rehab uh, projects and we use anti washout admixtures in uh, underwater usage and we use corrosion inhibiting admixtures so i told about corrosion attributing to 5% of our uh, gdp right so we use uh, these admixtures to reduce uh, uh, the corrosion losses and in terms of uh, sand i told that we are trying to explore alternatives to sand so we are trying to explore copper slag as an alternative to sand and our annual requirement is 1.5 billion metric tons of uh, sand and we are trying to achieve through all these alternative materials and two areas we are yet to explore is use of quarry dust as aggregate and uh, research says that 20 to 25 percent of our total quarry output can be used as an uh, aggregate another area which we are to explore is our construction and demolition waste uh, and the research says that uh, in India, annual construction demolition waste is 420 million tons, amongst which uh, 30 percent can be the yield as aggregates. Okay, that means that 133 million tons of aggregates you'll get from our CND waste. And uh, together with MSAN, you all know about MSAN, it will help to meet our annual uh, requirement. So these are advancements in construction materials. And we'll now speak about advancements in construction technology. So one important advancement is nanotechnology in construction. We are having nanomaterials to improve the better hydration of uh, cement particles. So we are having uh, nano alumina and nano silica that's being used. And uh, to improve the strength and durability of uh, concrete and achieve better partic particle packing capabilities and uh, improved mechanical properties we are using nano silica to improve the fatigue resistance we are uh, using nano copper uh, particles and uh, in order to inculcate a self-healing capability we are uh, using uh, nano titanium okay and uh, particularly in concrete road construction cc road construction you can use uh, nano titanium and uh, even for fire resistance so we are uh, going for a coating uh, through a spray-on cementitious uh, process, which will improve the fire resistance of uh, steel structures. And uh, finally, looking at material for prefabricated construction and 3D printing, I told about uh, these are the advancements, right? Precast and 3D printing are the advancements. So what is the problem with respect to precast? Okay. And recently also IIT Tripathi building, a lot of hostel buildings were done through precast uh, technology and uh, advantages are there. One is uh, water savings is there. Okay, you can address that, uh, you know, huge water consumption is there for concrete, right? So it can come down if you use uh, precast and uh, for this, the material that you use needs to have uh, self-curing capabilities. So uh, self-curing, um, you know, admixtures are added for this. But if you look at the entire process of uh, precast, okay, and uh, different materials we are trying to explore here. And one typical material that was used in uh, the IIT Tirupati hostel complex was this glass fiber reinforced uh, concrete panels, GFRC it is called. Okay? Or it is called uh, uh, GFRG as well. There is another material called GFRG, that's glass fiber reinforced uh, gypsum concrete uh, material. And uh, they were trying to use this material, but the important problem is that the demand Okay, to go for a precast, you should have a lot of demand surrounding the precast uh, plant. And only then this uh, precast concept will be viable. If you don't have the demand, okay, the economies of scale won't uh, work out. And for this particular project, uh, the precast uh, plant was there in uh, Kerala. Okay, so all the materials had to, uh, all these panels had to come from uh, Kerala. So logistics is a huge uh, problem. Okay. So if the sites are not near to the precast factory, it can be a huge uh, problem. During uh, transportation, a lot of damage also happens to the precast panels. And another issue is that, so once these materials uh, come to site, you will find that some materials are missing. Okay, Why these materials are missing is that, so trucks have limited capacity. 
and you might be planning for one zone okay for this zone one you will be listing out that these are the panels that i require but it will happen that no not all these material will fill will uh, no fill in one truck maybe you require another one more smaller truck for this yeah, and that's not uh, feasible right economically it's not uh, feasible so only one truck load will come in that uh, the complete set of materials won't be there this was the second uh, problem and the third problem with respect to logistics was that all these panels came to site and uh, the designer absolutely knew which panel you no know, fitted where but the people at the site they were not able to make a head or tail out of you know, which panel needs to come where so that's when later on they tried to use G, uh, this uh, RFID tags and using these RFID tags, they were able to identify. Okay, So this panel needs to come here and uh, some, to some extent this uh, challenge was mitigated. But the major challenge was that, okay, in in-situ construction, a lot of adjustment or uh, Hindi it's called jugad. A lot of jugad is done at the site level in in-situ traditional construction. But uh, in prefabricated construction, Okay, the tolerance that is available, okay, it's very, very less. That means that you need skilled labor to work with this level of uh, tolerance and no jugad is possible at the site. Okay, So when you compare the cost of uh, in-situ traditional construction and prefab construction, always the prefab construction is going to be costly. One is you no, know, all these logistics challenges is there. Another is that you need skilled labor for precast construction. And you know that a lot of things happen in the factory, right? And uh, only the assembly happens at the site. So you need skilled labor, both in the factory and the site. And so skilled labor is costly. And in a factory, okay, you need to pay the compensation as per the factory act. All the overtime and all these things are paid perfectly. Okay, and it is paid perfectly to the skilled workers. And if you take in-situ construction, traditional construction, so these laborers, so these are all unskilled people. And you don't pay them as per the no norms. So it's not an apple to apple comparison at all. On one side, it's unskilled labor, okay, whom you don't pay very well in traditional construction. On the other hand, for precast construction, it's very, very skilled labor. Okay. And if cost-wise, if you take always precast will be costly. And in all the projects, what we are finding is so they're telling that precast will cost two thousand crores and it will take only one and a half years, whereas in situ will take two years to construct this, okay, six months more than this, but it will cost only 1,500 crores. People are going for in-situ construction or traditional construction. So they're not realizing this value of uh, this, uh, you know, six months that they're uh, saving. The building can be put early into use. That's the important advantage, right? We can build faster and focus on more uh, projects. And this is in terms of uh, construction. And even after construction, during operations and maintenance, all these precast structures, the waterproofing is uh, very, very poor. Okay, And this kind of construction is a huge hit in US, Australia and European countries. And why it is hit there? Okay, You might be having a question. So there also waterproofing problems should come, right? But important difference is the way you, we use our buildings. So in US, Australia and Europe and all these uh, countries, when they go for precast structures, Okay. And always their practice is that the buildings are dry use. Their houses, their bathrooms, it, it is for dry use. If you go into the bathroom of, uh, say, uh, US houses, Australian houses, so water won't be there. Okay, but won't, Water won't be lying on the floor. But the way we use our buildings, we pour buckets of water to clean the house. Okay, And that doesn't happen in uh, uh, US or Australia, depending on the climate and all these conditions only. Okay. And our use of toilet is wet use. Okay, so our bathrooms will be always uh, full of uh, water. The floor will be full of uh, water. Okay, and uh, because of this, okay, so this uh, waterproofing is a huge problem. And if you take these alternative materials like GFRG or GFRC panels in IIT Tirupati, so these panels are getting swollen because of waterproofing issues. So these are some typical issues that we need to address in terms of materials and in terms of how we are going to construct this. So, so advanced technology can help here. So if there's a simulation tool like Revit and we can formulate and identify these panels, okay, and uh, we can also monitor the construction, we can generate 4D models, we can attach the schedule and we can see the simulation, how we need to place the panels. And uh, so we can rehearse the construction once and then we can start construction, right? And based on the progress of the site, you can give the feedback to the precast factory 
on okay so next week this material should not come you earlier plan for this uh, delivery but right now we can give the feedback based on progress at the site that no we don't re require this material next week okay so you'll have a just in time system so technological interventions are required in precast uh, construction another one is 3d printing we are going for a material like spray concrete geopolymer concrete is being used which is uh, having high workability and uh, we are also going for admixtures to uh, impart self compaction capabilities some images of uh, 3d printing you can uh, see here and uh, in manufacturing terms it is called additive manufacturing okay you build this layer by layer and you are heavily dependent on robotics uh, here okay so again here you will realize that both civil and mechanical engineers are required here and uh, this is an image from our indian so chennai is a 3d printed house so we have reinforced uh, 3d printing as well okay and uh, other advancements are there in terms of uh, say uh, robotics so robots are being used for uh, shuttering and uh, reinforcement for bar bending we are using uh, robot for concrete placement we are using robot for road laying as well and for finishing activities our alumni from the gulf they are uh, giving us feedback saying that for plastering and for painting for uh, tiling works robots are there that are being used in uh, gulf and uh, floor finishing robots are there and uh, also building automation is another so this is with respect to uh, construction whatever we saw here even after the building is done okay so there are uh, aspects of automation that is uh, being used today and how is this automation done is that so entire building entire floor is divided into zones and uh, so there is a building management system and uh, this building management system takes inputs from all the sensors that is uh, placed so you can have occupancy sensors okay and uh, this occupancy sensors will give you input on where people are there Okay, you can have a huge uh, floor area, but maybe people are only working from a small uh, space. So based on this occupancy, you can better target your lighting attention and HVAC attention. So you are able to reduce your energy cost. You are able to improve uh, the comfort as well. Okay, you are able to increase your productivity as well. So these these are aspects of building automation in operations and maintenance. Another advancement is in the in terms of. um earthquake resistant uh, building structures in terms of uh, construction technology we are going for shear wall technology and uh, so what is the advantage of shear wall uh, uh, buildings so these have uh, high ductility okay so these concrete walls shear walls have high plane stiffness and these are placed at uh, convenient locations and are economically used to provide necessary resistance to horizontal uh, forces and uh, research says that so shear wall buildings can withstand an earthquake up to in the richter scale of 8 uh, even after 8 if there is an earthquake of 8.5 or 8.6 also research says that the building gives enough time to the occupants to vacate the building before the building collapses okay and uh, you can also have uh, reinforced brick walls that are being uh, right now uh, used as shear walls okay that is another active area of uh, research and uh, shear so precast shear walls are there and uh, this is also uh, an active area of uh, development so it is available in various uh, profiles okay and uh, advancements in electrical uh, projects so vishnu sir will be covering this uh, particular aspect so plenty of advancements are there in terms of our uh, grid systems and uh, also in terms of uh, mechanical aspects of uh, projects in terms of interconnected machines um and uh, in terms of 4d printing technology as well so vishnu sir will be covering this and uh, another important application is that we use iot in construction nowadays and this term is used for granted right everybody says uh, iot and you'll get irritated what is this iot and uh, so a particular use is with iot okay and with erp systems you can have 60 bim models you have heard about 3d models that means that the entire building you are representing in 3d in your uh, computer you have revit for this and we have 4d okay we are attaching the schedule to this 3d model and uh, we are generating this construction sequence actual sequence and uh, or planned sequence and actual sequence you can compare using that you can find out where the activities are getting delayed 
okay so in the site plenty of activities will be going on and you won't know which one is on track and which one is uh, behind track and which one is ahead of uh, the schedule and uh, so using the simulations you can track the progress visualize the progress and you can attach the cost also it becomes 5d okay so monthly you will get the cash flows and uh, that will become the 5d model and even if you attach operations and maintenance it becomes 60 for attaching operations and maintenance you need this iot technology and you might question me okay is this uh, available in the industry okay, or you might be asking have you seen 6g bim in the industry so in our country in nagpur metro okay for the first time in india they have done 60 bim so that is the they have integrate integrated also this operations and maintenance in this uh, 5d bim and they have made this 6d bim so what they are doing is in all the structures say beams and columns is there they are attaching stress and strain gauges so these sensors are continuously giving uh, inputs on uh, the stress and strain levels in these uh, structures and uh, based on this so this input goes to the building management system and from bms it comes to erp system and here the erp system is linked to your 3d model so in your uh, you can you might have seen this in uh, movies in industries a dashboard will be there it will tell that no this uh, no this boiler is 50 percent full or this valve is 50 percent open so a dashboard will be there with a lot of these indicators and the goal of that Naku metro was to establish that kind of a dashboard for the entire metro so in the entire metro so they have the such uh, dashboards and now they'll be readily getting inputs okay by virtue of uh, this iot so if uh, some element is going to fail uh, so it will automatically indicate uh, this, uh, it will show in uh, 3D, indicate in 3D that this element is going to fail. And automatically job cards will be generated for that particular uh, maintenance team. Okay, so this is how IoT is being used. And also, it's not just sensors, it's also actuators. So what should happen when fire is there or what should happen when some terrorist attack is there? Everything is predetermined. Okay. As, or what should happen if uh, a train stops somewhere in the middle okay everything is uh, predetermined a set of uh, actions are triggered okay so this door should close automatically lift should come to the ground floor so it is being achieved through this uh, iot technology okay so both sensors and actuators are a part of this uh, iot and even if uh, some uh, camera is there or some air conditioner is there that's not working automatically through sensors it will be detected Okay, usually in our buildings, we don't mind this, whether some AC is not working or the camera is not working. To uh, come into the notice of this uh, operations and maintenance team, it takes months. But immediately if uh, something fails, like camera or air conditioner, uh, because of these sensors, it will come to the dashboard and uh, automatically job card will be generated. Okay, even for operations and maintenance, so fix the number of spares, all the warranty information and uh, any uh, service video and all other things are digitally so stored and even for safety right and you this iot is used okay so companies say lnt what they are doing is they are giving wearable watches smart watches they are going to workers and they're continuously monitoring these workers okay so what is his heart rate and what are his vitals they're continuously monitoring and uh, depending on that okay so if that guy is uh, not healthy suddenly his uh, heart rate is uh, becoming low Okay, they're instantly observing this and they're not asking him to uh, no, work for some time. Okay, or if he falls down, automatically they're uh, getting this uh, information. If something hits him, okay, that information is getting and they're continuously observing his uh, posture. Okay, and it's not just from watches, they're uh, even hats have sensors, even their jackets have uh, these sensors. From these, they're getting the information on uh, what is the condition of this worker okay and through this posture whether his working posture is correct or not okay so all these inputs they are getting and uh, they are trying to better manage safety at the site okay and uh, that's with respect to say civil works now mechanical uh, people will be concerned okay so what are the mechanical advances in these uh, uh, companies you'll be worried about okay so in uh, hvac as well there are plenty of advancements and today we have geothermal hvac system ductless hvac systems uh, so this is the, we have heard about radiative uh, okay heating so ductless situations systems are used where you have uh, radiative cooling that means that uh, 
uh, you have seen your parents, they'll go to the terrace and pour water during summer, right? So same uh, concept. What they're doing is uh, they're passing tubes of water in the walls and uh, in the ceilings, okay? And uh, from this, radiative cooling is happening. So this has plenty of uh, efficiency and uh, savings. Okay, so with respect to HVC, what is happening? And uh, HVC is nothing but heating, ventilation, and uh, air conditioning. Okay, and uh, with respect to ACs, okay, so where there is a scope in the construction industry is here. Okay, for the centralized air conditioning system, for split ACs, absolutely you don't have a role. Mechanical engineers in for construction management, there is what construction management is there for split ACs? Nothing is there, right? But your role is required for centralized air conditioning system okay so why your role is required because this system is complicated this system has two sides one is air side is there another one is water side whatever you're seeing is what air side okay but you don't get to see the water side so as an MEP person or a HVAC person MEP is nothing but mechanical engineering plumbing works okay this uh, HVAC is a part of mechanical works okay and if you are in charge of construction management, what is your responsibility? You look at the budget of the client, you look at the need of the client. And uh, so for a hotel buildings, a different kind of uh, HVC system called VRF system is uh, being chosen. Because for, for office buildings, IIT buildings is there. For the entire floor, only one temperature you will set. Okay. Now for hotels, okay, each room will need to have separate controls. So that's where VRF system is being in. Uh, used in hotels. So uh, depending on the need of the client, who is the client, depending on the application and uh, depending of, on the space constraints, okay, and uh, depending on the aesthetics also, you'll uh, choose the system. In some cases, you can have uh, grills. In some cases, you need to go for cassette units. And uh, so uh, you'll see the floor layout and you will give inputs to the design team saying that this is how the system should be design okay. you will give inputs to the design team uh, about the civil uh, structures so this is the location of the beam and uh, column and this is where power is available and this is where water is available so this is how space is available for servicing and you will give these inputs to the design team and uh, accordingly they will give you the design and you will forward the design to the client so client is say tcs or cts you are say lnt is building a building for uh, tcs or cts and uh, you are the HVAC engineer. Okay, so you, from the design engineer, you will get the inputs, and you will give these inputs to the client, and you will get uh, the client's approval. So you will do the project management work, and once the approval comes, you will uh, take off the bill of quantities. Through Revit, you can model this in 3D. So Revit is not just for uh, civil engineers to model in 3D. Okay, there is also an MEP module in Revit where you can model all these electrical and mechanical HVAC work, all the piping work, and you can model this. And uh, from that, you can take off the quantities and you'll give it to the procurement team. You'll make sure that this material comes to site. And so you'll be in charge. So you won't be the person who is going to do the building or fitting work, okay? You will manage this work. You will have a lot of GETs working under you, okay? You will have a lot of, uh, say, diploma engineers working under you. And uh, IT people will be working under you. A lot of skilled people will be working under you, and you'll be uh, making them work. Okay, so your role is project management. That is your uh, role. And what what is the scope of work here? I told that there is an air side. So whatever you are seeing in the building, okay, so you are only seeing the air side. There's a duct that you might have seen. So on the duct, uh, you place these terminal devices called uh, div uh, grills or diffusers. Okay, square things, rectangular things through which air comes out, right? So uh, this is the air side, and there's also a water side, okay? How we are achieving this cooling? So there is a chiller, okay? And uh, so this is where your refrigeration air conditioning knowledge will come into play. So this chiller, okay? So we are using this chiller, we are uh, chilling the water, and from this uh, water heat exchange happens, okay, in the uh, air handling unit, and the air is getting cooled, okay? And that chilled air is getting distributed. Okay, and now you'll be having a question. So in your split unit, there is no this kind of a system. There is no water side at all. Okay, what you are, what, whatever you are seeing is only air side. So you'll be kind of thinking, why can't air be directly chilled using this chiller? Okay, so the point is that 
when you use air okay when you are chilling air you can transport it only for limited distance without uh, gaining heat okay so there will be a lot of heat gain and all this uh, chillness will be lost by the time you reach uh, various uh, floors so in each floor there will be an air handling unit and from the air handling unit okay so this heat exchange will happen so but water won't lose uh, this chillness or water won't gain heat uh, easily okay so for longer distances you can transport this chilled water and uh, so heat exchange will happen here you might have heard or learnt about heat exchanger design in your uh, subjects right in mechanical engineering subject you might have heard about heat ex exchanger design and that, that is what is happening in air handling units heat exchange happens and the air is getting uh, cooled okay and uh, this air is getting distributed so chiller okay so now in chiller okay i am telling that water is cooled on one side okay there is actually so heat rejection this heat needs to be gained on the other side right so again for heat acceptance you are using water if it is rejected in split units this heat is rejected to outside at atmosphere but there is a limit to which heat can be rejected to atmosphere so for rejecting heat also you are using water okay that's why it's called condenser water network and this water after gaining heat you need to take it to cooling tower and cool it and bring it back to the chiller okay again for uh, heat rejection you are preparing the water okay so this is the entire process and you need to do this system you need to build this kind of a system okay you need to do the high side works or uh, water side works and you need to do the air side works or low side works it is uh, called okay so chiller cooling tower pumps so these are the components and air handling units piping ducting insulation you need to carry out okay so this is your scope of work with respect to air conditioners so these are some examples of uh, chillers some images and this is how uh, cooling towers will look like you might have seen these cooling towers in malls near the parking area these uh, cooling towers can be found and uh, pumps are there to pump the chilled water and condenser uh, water and uh, you can see the ducts here and these are terminal devices through which air is uh, supplied or return air is taken that is also another function okay otherwise a lot of co2 will be there in the room right we need to remove the air also there is something called return air uh, air handling units also there okay so ventilation is another uh, purpose okay and for this uh, fans are there so we use uh, fans in basements uh, we use fans in staircase and uh, during normal conditions these fans in staircase they operate in one direction okay it is called staircase pressurization uh, fans you need to pressurize the this air in the staircase and other areas okay and why do you pressurize this whenever the door is opened okay this is a fresh air goes into the room okay the chilled air should not come out okay you are maintaining that uh, you no know, pressurization in the staircase it is at maintained at higher pressure than your room and during fire opposite happen okay so based on fire the fire detection unit will be there that will detect the fire and will give input to the staircase pressure station fans the fans will operate in opposite uh, direction okay that means that the staircase will be depressurized why you are depressurizing so that all the oxygen okay from the room when the people open the door and come out all the oxygen will come out okay uh, because your staircase is depressurized and uh, so in that fire triangle you are cutting out that oxygen okay oxygen is not available for fire fire will uh, stop Okay, that's the purpose. So, uh, ventilation is not just from your comfort uh, perspective. Okay, from your health perspective, from safety perspective, also they have a lot of applications, and they have a lot of industrial applications uh, as well. Okay, and uh, so that's about uh, HVAC system. So you need to build and manage these systems as a part of mechanical works. Another major mechanical work in uh, buildings, okay, is fire protection systems, and uh, so what is this fire protection system you have this hydrant system okay so hydrants you might have uh, i'll show you images okay so where uh, there will be openings and you can plug rubber uh, line hoses in these uh, openings and uh, you can take water whenever there is a fire and the important requirement here is always the fire hydrant system is 100% pressurized you can see this fire hydrant lines are the red colored pipes these are fire fighting pipes always they are 100% pressurized that means that so uh, always pumps will be kept in a standby position 
okay there is a particular pump called hydropneumatic pump that is used for this particular uh, purpose whenever there is a pressure drop that pump will run okay and uh, there is automatic sprinkler system in your buildings you might have found uh, this uh, sprinklers are there okay and uh, there are spray systems that are used in transformers and data centers as well novex systems are uh, used so how this system works is that there will be an inert gas okay and this inert gas will rapidly expand and it will displace all the oxygen in that particular uh, room say a data center is there server is there you cannot use water to extinguish you cannot use any chemical to extinguish so how they extinguish uh, the fire is that uh, this uh, inert gas expands rapidly and displaces oxygen oxygen goes out and uh, now we are cutting that oxygen component that fire triangle so fire will stop and foam system is there okay foams they use in uh, electrical application they go for foam system and uh, gas extinguish system is there there's also passive fire protection systems uh, so these are components of uh, fps fire protection systems and i told you about this triangle right so either we try to attack the fuel part or the oxygen part or heat part in all these uh, areas there is contribution of fire protection system okay we try to address all these uh, three areas okay so how do we address this through um, active and passive fire protection uh, systems and these are all active fire protection systems so your hydrants are there sprinklers are there uh, and uh, fire detection alarm system is there you might have seen these uh extinguishers and this is your hydrants okay so this is your yard hydrants and there's also fire escape hydrants so you need to uh, build and erect these uh, fire protection systems that is uh, your role and uh, again i'm saying so you won't be the welder okay you won't be lifting pipes and placing it you need to manage the construction you will have people to work under you here some photos of your scope of work these are sprinkler systems so a sprinkler piping will be there so above the false ceiling all these services will be there okay even electrical uh, services will be there okay foam systems and uh, fire detection and alarm systems we will have uh, seen okay so fire alarm panel is there and these are fire detection and alarm uh, systems so your fire detection unit and passive uh, systems are Uh, signages uh, like this, or uh, whenever there is a partition. Okay, so important problem is we need to zone the buildings. We need to create zones. That means that when fire is there in one building or one room, okay, it not go to the other room. And how does it go to the other room? If there is a fire because of the cable, this cable goes from one room to another room. And where, wherever there is a partition, okay, that means wherever there is a wall, in that wall. wherever this uh, cables are crossing you will put this fire sealant so if there is a fire here on reaching this uh, place the fire sealant will stop the fire it won't allow uh, the fire to proceed further okay and uh, so that's why we are uh, zoning all the buildings and we put these uh, systems and uh, another system is public health engineering system okay so i'll cover a part of me mechanical works and uh, professor vishnu as i told he'll present about electrical scope of works in uh, construction so plumbing is both civil and mechanical part of uh, works and uh, so the very colloquial usage of this uh, word is uh, plumbing but in technical terms it is called public health engineering and uh, it's not just uh, piping work okay you need to make sure that water supply is done okay water is uh, treated and uh, sewage also is uh, treated you also have storm water drainage network as a part of public health engineering irrigation is there that means landscape irrigation so if some some landscape is there lawn is there you need to provide irrigation for these uh, uh, things and uh, there is water treatment plant there is sewage treatment plant so all these uh, things need to be built and you need to monitor uh, the erection of these systems so swimming pools will be there fountains will be there and apart from this your uh, internal water supply external water supply your fixtures will be there okay bathroom fixtures uh, will be there so these are your uh, treatment uh, plants okay and this is how the entire uh, process happens so you get the water from the source you temporarily store this you treat that and uh, then you take it for uh, distribution 
and uh, then you take it to the main pipeline and there'll be control walls as well and uh, then you'll be taking them to sanitary uh, fittings and fixtures and the, through the traps you'll be capturing the wastewater and uh, then there'll be a drainage or baseline that you need to construct and there'll be chambers uh, through which you'll be taking it for sewage uh, treatment so these are your uh, typical sanitary fixtures so you'll have a uh, lot of plumbers and ida people under your disposal and you need to manage the work now okay you will never lift anything or do any plumbing work on your own you need to just manage the construction you need to manage the design and uh, you need to manage the procurement and you need to manage the erection of uh, these uh, things okay and uh, so this is what met execution is uh, about so you'll uh, get the contractual recommends you'll understand the need uh, for the MEP works and based on the need you will be coordinating the strategy whether you are going to do design in house you are going to outsource this design whether you are going to do this uh, uh, work in house that means that uh, you will have your own ita people and your own uh, welders uh, plumbers and so on or are you are you going to give this as a contract as a back to back package are you going to give it to someone else you will be deciding that and you will be deciding then uh the work sequence you'll be coordinating with the civil team as well okay so because all the works are dependent on the civil team and there'll be a lot of concealed pipes as well during concrete uh, during concreting itself so these uh, pipes need to be uh placed and these conduits electrical conduits need to be placed and uh, you need to carry out concreting there so these so this is how your work will kind of look like you need to manage you need to get the letter of intent from the client and you need to issue work orders to uh, say labor contractors or subcontractors and you look at the specification based on this you'll manage with the design team and make sure that the design meets with the specifications and you'll get the contract this this uh, drawings from uh, the design team or the models from the design team and you'll get the models or drawings approved from the client okay and uh, so mep execution so there is something called back to back strategy or in house strategy i told about this you can give this as a separate contract to another agency or you can do it in house and uh, in some cases it can be that uh, major components will be there okay so that will be purchased by you as a contractor and remaining smaller items you will put it in the scope of the subcontractors like pipes or uh, cables so this is a hybrid uh, strategy okay and uh, so this is how the work sequence kind of looks like okay so as i said uh, loi contractual recommend you will uh, look at design uh, design approval and coordination drawings is an important responsibility okay you will be taking drawings from various uh, mep teams from hvc team from firefighting team uh, from plumbing team from electrical team you will coordinate you will prepare the coordinated drawing you will see put post all these drawings and uh, all these models and you will see where the clashes are there between uh, pipes and ducts there will be some clash between firefighting pipes and electrical uh, cable trays some uh, clash will be there you will resolve these uh, clashes that means that you will move the pipes or you will move the duct to the left or right and uh, then you will do the work okay so this is the how your work will look like and there will be several enabling works or supporting works okay so you need to coordinate with the civil team for instance you need foundations okay so for service room you need to coordinate with the civil team for equipment foundation you need to serve with, uh, pro, you know um, interact with the civil team and wherever uh, so these cables or ducts pass through the walls here again these openings need to be provided you coordinate with the civil team to create these uh, openings and uh, cutouts okay i told that during construction you need to place the pipes as well okay so before concreting you need to place the pipes and uh, so finally you will see an end product like this but underneath okay so a lot of work goes on okay that is the work of the mechanical and electrical engineers so for this what do you need you need project management uh, skills you need to learn about lean project management so why do you need to learn about lean project management in manufacturing there is something called lean manufacturing okay so through this uh, approach 
so uh, we are reducing the waste lot of assembly lines is there and you just make sure that lot of certainty is there quality requirements are being met okay so you exactly know uh, how much time a car uh, needs okay to be manufactured and assembled but that kind of certainty is not there in construction we are trying to bring that uh, certainty in construction through lean concept okay so, so we have that concept in manufacturing why can't we bring that concept to construction as well but in construction the process kind of looks uh, different okay so this is your uh, role to inculcate lean concepts during civil mechanical and electrical uh, works so what you'll be doing one of the tool important lean tool is called last planner system and what we do in this last planner system is so so this kind of system is not there in manufacturing okay because construction is different than manufacturing in manufacturing the products move from assembly lines okay in one they move in assembly line they move from one workstation to another and uh, here okay the product doesn't move the product is uh, stationary right and uh, so last planner system is about how you are going to do the planning typically we have heard a planning approach you decide that this building will take 2 years and uh, then you'll try to make it in 2 years but in last planning system it's bottom to top okay so it's not top to bottom uh, so this bottom level foreman will give you insights so you will have monthly targets okay so it will be a kind of iteration between top down and bottom up so say you have monthly look ahead schedules and you will take monthly look ahead schedules and you give it to the foreman and say that if i want to construct this slab okay or this duct work in one month okay so what do you require and this foreman will tell okay i require this material i require this information i require this laborers i require uh, this uh, machinery and equipment he'll tell all these uh, things and uh, now you will find out who is in charge of this material and that person will be there and he'll tell that so um, if i have this information okay from the design department so this material can be ordered okay then you will find out who is this design person so you will try to resolve the bottlenecks okay from bottom to top and you will get the work done and you will reduce a lot of wastage here and then you bring a lot of certainty to project management so this is one of the responsibilities of a construction project manager whether you are a civil engineer or mechanical engineer or electrical engineer and uh, i told about this right in construction there are several kind of uh, projects and uh, now another strategy is that we are not looking projects as unique entities okay there are several common features across projects and there are several common resources that are employed that need to be employed across uh, projects and uh, this is one of the objectives of uh, strategic uh, project management okay so you can create rate contracts if you aggregate the requirements across uh, projects so you can get uh, materials at a better rate okay and uh, so that that is called a program based approach to projects and uh, companies like lnt so they have a regional office and in this regional office they'll do this kind of a strategic uh, management they'll manage all the projects and uh, for all the projects they need to manage the managerial information system mis they need to do the coordination and control they need to manage the cash flows working capital they need to optimize for all these uh, projects and uh, projects are uh, involving several stakeholders so you need to work under strict uh, timelines so what is the need of the rs you need project management skills in these uh, projects you need specialized techniques to oversee planning design and construction so this is where all the disciplines uh, come together so as a project manager you'll be planning the activities you'll be organizing the project team coordinating various teams managing the de deliverables you'll be managing the time cost you'll be establishing regular meetings and you'll be managing reports on these projects as well so key skills that you require is you need scheduling skills how to schedule the work and you need costing skills as well you need communication skills resource management skills quality management skills risk management skills you require and financial management skills you require a special kind of uh, uh, no financial tools we use we use job cost reports to manage the financial progress in the projects we use techniques like earned value methods and you need to learn about these tools to manage these uh, projects we need to gain knowledge on modern construction methods and uh, how to read a contract and how to identify risk from contracts and how to manage contracts and uh, claims and uh, client you need to manage the client as well a lot of computer applications we are uh, finding today okay so what are the typical computer applications we are uh, finding is we are finding that uh, my msp and primer is being used for planning 
you need to gain knowledge on candy and uh, for uh, road projects repetitive projects a method called linear scheduling method is used and for road estimation calcon is used for risk management at risk is used for statistical uh, software spss is used and i told about bim what is 3d bim 4d bim 5d bim what are the advantages so there some advancements are here as well so you will take up roles as planning engineer construction engineers contracts engineers and quantity surveyors and uh, project controls so quantity surveyors are required for claims management building and other purposes uh, or safety engineers are required or logistics managers are required and uh, okay so finally the question that you will be asking is so if i need to gain all this knowledge okay how can i gain that okay maybe through a post graduation in construction management you can gain this knowledge okay so professor vishnu will tell about uh, how this uh, kind of post graduation program looks like and um, so all civil mechanical and electrical engineers can take up this uh, program and i told that there is a huge recommend for uh, construction management personnel okay from all the background and the uh, ultimate question that you might have is does this industry pay very well okay for me the software industry is there that is uh, that will readily take me i don't need to go through all these uh, things okay so construction industry in 2012 my salary okay was 25000 as a post graduate in construction management so my salary was 25000 in 2012 okay so that is the gross monthly salary just in a span of 2 years you can look at my pay slip this is my actual pay slip okay in lnt so your salary will become triple nobody speaks about this nobody tells you about the hike that you will receive in no other company or industry okay no in no other industry you will receive hikes like this your pay will become tripled in a span of uh, okay 2 years and today average starting package okay, in the industry is 8 lakhs per annum for post graduates in construction management and lot of benefits are there for instance your bachelor accommodation or your family accommodation will be borne by the company only when i was staying in mumbai i stayed in a 45000 rupees rental flat and we shared three people shared that lnt only borne that cost okay and if you are a family also if you are married also your entire cost will be borne by accommodation cost will be borne by the company only no other industry you no know, gives these kind of benefits they'll give a very comprehensive insurance package that will cover your uh, family your parents your uh, children your spouse as well if you find the cost of this package in the industry insurance industry it's about uh, 1 lakh at least okay and all these things are not a part of this uh, package in it the ctc concept is there but in construction there is no ctc concept all these benefits are over and above the package and other benefits okay so in 5 years the company will give you a car okay or they'll uh, 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 do all these uh, things for you, and uh, on condition that you will work for another five more years. It's called company-owned uh, car scheme. And uh, other benefits like uh, every two or three years, you will be allowed to change your mobile phone at company's cost, and uh, laptop, tab, all your phone bills, internet bills will be borne by the company. So these are typical benefits that, that nobody will tell about. So to join this industry, you need knowledge about advancements in materials, technology, and project management. and uh, so you need to upskill yourself in these areas and probably this is where nikmar can help you so we guarantee that you will feel at home at nikmar and with the construction industry and uh, i think i have made this message clear that civil engineers mechanical engineers and electrical engineers you are indispensable for construction so now professor vishnu will come here and he'll tell you about the electrical aspects and some mechanical aspects in construction and uh, finally he'll tell about how you can access the opportunities in the construction industry so very good afternoon or uh, so uh, today we are here to 
uh, discuss about the career opportunities. Uh, I think my screen is visible. Uh, can you tell me anyone? My is my screen is visible to all? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's fine. Thank you for the feedback. So without delay, we will start the important factors which will be helping us uh, in many aspects uh, related to the electrical and mechanical area. So uh, the first and foremost thing that we discussed, uh, we are we have to discuss about uh, the interdisciplinary aspects of engineering projects. So the projects we will be dealing in our country or you can see across the country uh, that is actually involving various kind of trade people. Suppose we will take an example of a metro project. Uh, you can see that uh, the, from the starting of piling activities, uh, you, uh, the civil engineer people will be involved. But if you see the later stage of that project, suppose you are, you are, you are having the rolling and stocking, uh, like uh, you will be having metro uh, train system. So there we record to have the mechanical engineering uh, graduates. And of course, if you see the later stage in the project, uh, that will be the signaling and communication system. So there the electrical and electronics and communication students are be most wanted. So actually uh, the interdisciplinary aspects of different projects, like uh, these kind of examples, uh, that's what I have taken. So the uh, these kind of projects uh, are interdisciplinary in nature. So there you will be having uh, all trades of people they are working together for an achievement of a particular project. So uh, here, uh, I would like to share some of the thoughts and uh, some of the insights that we can. There are several opportunities are open to all kind of graduates, whether it is civil, whether it is mechanical, whether it is electrical or electronics and communications. So uh, the lot of opportunities are there and the lot of opportunities uh, we can achieve based on uh, achieving several kind of skill sets. So now the skill, the terminology which is called the skill sets is very important for an achievement. So now the question about the traditional practice or traditional knowledge acquiring uh, methodologies. Like uh, we are having def lot of uh, definitions, lot of uh, def uh, lot, lot of uh, engineering related things we are studying in our graduate schools, but when you come to a practical exposure, whether we are doing this kind of, or whether these are applicable or not, that is a question. Because the technology now, uh, it's today, it's there, that may not be there tomorrow because it's growing dynamically in manner. So the technological advancement, so it's very important to acquire the required amount of skills to uh, make a, or to do several kind of projects. So. There, we have several kind of uh, importance, the skill set acquiring. So one of the major area we need to focus, that is the skill set, how we will achieve the skills, right? So skill and maybe in the form of software, uh, in the form of uh, the latent advancements in the area, or you are using some kind of uh, methodologies, techniques, strategies, so that we need to understand properly so uh, this once you will be getting into the particular area we will be providing several kind of skill set that is required for the industry so one of the uh, i will take several examples in our country which is more into the advancements of the electrical projects as i told it's not limited to the electrical the electrical projects will be done only by the electrical it's not like that the electrical projects, the mechanical projects, all kind of trade peoples are being uh, are required in various levels. So there are several new emerging technologies are there in the electrical projects, uh, which will be all kind of trade peoples will be utilized. So one of them is national grid and smart grid of policies, microgrid, then power sector projects and the railway electrification. So we will see one by one, the growth of the power sector. If you see the ninth plan and 11th plan, you can see the 
importance of several renewable energy power sources and we can see a drastic improvement uh, in the uh, renewable energy power sector and this indicates that the number of projects and the investment or the uh, foreign development or for FDI investments and other sources of investment is being more focused on the renewable energy power sources and especially in the wind uh, power source. Okay, so, so here also we can see several addition in 12th uh, five year plan the proposed addition of the wind and solar power plant you can see from this particular table right so here also the importance and the future aspects of the projects that we can easily identify but that means the number of projects the number of human resources are required for these kind of projects are going to be there at least for the completion of the uh, next year uh, 10 to 15 years because some of the projects require a lot of time and it will take a lot of time to complete so that that much amount of the workforces are required from the various level electrical mechanical civil the work will start from the civil it will go with mechanical then electrical and electronics and communications in that way so so what is power grid uh, just a brief uh, idea about the power grids or the the power grids will be connected, the interconnected power system to enable the demand or, and to uh, en enable the uninterrupted power supply across our country. And we are having several power grid and these are will be operated by the National Power Grid Corporation or the Power Grid Corporation of India. And so now there are several areas, the upcoming and the emerging areas which are focused to the smart grid or the national grid, uh, national green, uh, or the national smart grid missions, and uh, of course, these are some of the pilot projects approved by Ministry of Power recently uh, to enhance the uh, the importance of the grid systems and to improve and to enhance the utilization of renewable energy power sources. So the smart grid in the sense, I will just make it very clear this what is smart grid. So we'll be having several power resources are there from the power resources you, you record to distribute the power to various sectors like uh, you record to uh, uh, ac uh, across the states you need to transport the power. So there are several hurdles are there because almost all the conventional power sources are very remotely located. And of course, you, we know that there are several issues are coming with the uh, greenhouse emissions and global warming. So the country and the world is going to change uh, in different manner, the more focused on the renewable energy power sources. So the smart grid uh, will be helping in many aspects that will be utilizing the renewable energy power sources and that will be integrated to our available power grid system. So what will happen, the demand or the that uh, amount of power that we are uh, considering or the resources from the renewable energy will be slowly uh, increasing and we can balance uh, in many ways. That conventional power source and the renewable energy power source can be uh, equalized. So this will be helping in many aspects like uh, uh, uninterrupted uninterrupted power sources, uh, power systems can be enabled. And there are so many, uh, the green based on the uh, green systems. These are based on green systems. So the impact to the environment will be very much less. So uh, the one of the major uh, things in this uh, 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 grid system that we have discussed, uh, which is related to the smart grid system. So here you can see, the, there will be the in, the entire grid system will be connected to the wind, solar, uh, then uh, the conventional power systems like nuclear, uh, thermal power plant, hydroelectric. So the the ecosystem will be developed in the, such a manner that it will be balanced in many ways. So another one uh, area which will be focused in the smart grid is with no blackouts will be there. So the black blackouts will not be there because uh, the endless and we'll be having a seamless connectivity uh, of the different power sources. 
So as I told, there will be a better uh, de demand and supply management is possible. The reduction of carbon emissions, the energy management and the proactive uh, implementation and proactive interests in the electrical sector. So, so what? So one of the other area the um, ministries and the governments are focusing on the microgrid. Uh, I don't know how many people they are knowing. Some of the, uh, some of the government on the state level, electric electrical authorities they are giving subsidy if you are keeping um, one kilowatt or um, greater than um, that much. Uh, um, the solar uh, solar PV panels. So the microgrid is nothing but in our home we will be generating some sort of uh, energy either from the solar wind but wind is not that much uh, into the microgrid now but government having several plannings to improve these kind of um, grid activities. So the panel, uh, the PV panel or the photovoltaic panel, the en energy will be generated and that will be utilized for our, so it's like a sustainable uh, power generation and the consumption and remaining whatever amount, uh, amount of energy that we are additionally, we are uh, producing that can be given to the grid. So when, wherever it is required, the uh, sufficient amount of energy can be utilized. So. By this also, uh, the, as I told, the microgrid, the smart grid, this will be helping to reduce the load in the conventional fuel uh, resources. Like we have seen several uh, issues nowadays happening to the crude oil. So crude oil, coal, these are conventional fuels and we can't uh, rely or we can depend on this kind of fuel for much long time. So we need an alternative. So these are some of the government initiatives uh, in this kind of projects. So now, why? what kind of projects we may expect in these kind of areas in near future? So government having already formulated several policies, the government of India, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, they have formulated several policies, their uh, incentives and subsidies to uh, improve the projects in these kind of areas. So some of the startups and new companies, they are coming up. Uh, one of the example is Green Co, which is more into the renewable energy power sources. Uh, so like that, several companies, they are going to uh, implement their projects in India, uh, like uh, another big giants like Siemens, Vestas, they are also moving into these kind of works. So the microgrid smart grid will be helping us uh, to uh, enhance our uh, renewable energy capacity. So governments, they are open to uh, these kind of projects. And of course, these pilot projects are the clear indication that in upcoming years, uh, there are a lot of opportunities are going to come uh, in these kind of areas. So these are uh, some of the details which is related to the smart grid and the conventional grid. As I told, there are several aspects uh, which will be uh, influencing the uh, or the, uh, the investments and their uh, possibilities of the smart and uh, the uh, smart grid systems uh, and the micro. Uh, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, please explain the advantages and the disadvantages of the microgrid system. Yes. That's one one minute. I'm just going through that. So we'll be having the advantages for microgrid. There will be seamless uh, and there will not be any disruption. So like that we are having in our in our home, we are facing at least one or two hours every day. We are facing the power cuts, right? But this microgrid will be helping because we are the only person who is generating the power for, uh, power for our own activities. So what will happen if the power source from the conventional power, like our normal uh, from the uh, electrical board, the power is not there also, we will be having a second choice and we will be having a second uh, choice and we will be having second source of the power. So that, that will increase the uh, blackout that will be uh, reducing the blackouts and that will be increasing the utilization and the demand and that will be helping uh, many livelihoods. 
and of course this kind of uh, microgrid will help us in many aspects uh, like prevention of uh, peak load activities so the peak load activities which is normally 6 6 pm to 10 o'clock uh, 10 pm in the uh, evening so which will be all people will be all uh, people they will be utilizing the uh, power in greater manner so uh so in that way if you are having a microgrid in your home so you are try, you are actually be a sustainable manner so you will be uh, generating whatever power you, uh, required for you that you will be generating so there will not be any uh, load on the uh, main power grid systems and of course it is environment friendly and governments they are supporting they are giving good amount of su subsidy and uh, near near future you can see several small small startup companies and other companies they are into the implementation of microgrid but now the government taken a severe step like policy implementations and the law frameworks they have already be uh, already in place and slowly the projects are going to be uh, in life so and of course uh, this will be helping in many aspects and uh, when you talk about the smart grid applications the switching over the switching over from the one source to another source like uh, where the blackout is there so like directly we need to have an address like we will be having our, uh, in the village uh, we may not we have to frequently call the electrical people uh, we are not getting the power but if you are implementing the smart grid the system will be automatically it will be identified which are the locations which will be recorded and or the current back blackouts so that will be taken care by the uh, systems with the help of sensors with the help of actuators with the help of electronic and communication systems i hope that question is clear right uh, yes sir thank you sir yes so there are several disadvantage because these are in nascent stage of the microgrid especially the microgrids and the smart grids because the technology is emerging only so we have several lacunas in the system so uh, in my point of view that will, will not be a hurdle in a uh, national wise implementation uh, especially now the problems the uh, the metering issues will be there because we in our home we are don't have a smart meter right so we don't have any smart meter at present in our uh, state uh, or in our country itself so there is a huge development and technological advancement is required Uh, to meter because nowadays people are saying uh, we are generating in in uh, some of the case if you take from different states they are uh, some of the person they are implementing the microgrid and in their homes and they are charging huge amount of money uh, because the metering is not properly because sometime what will happen the meter uh, this uh, there this is a main issue uh, due to the lack of the smart metering so what will happen the uh, normal power supply that meter will be running and that will not taken care by the uh, whatever power we generated so there is a mismatch in that so that will be slot of money lost for the implementers so that's why one of the hurdle nowadays we are facing but uh, in my point of view that will be sorted uh, in very uh, limited time so so when we discuss about the government support in the power sector lot of supports they are giving the government like implementation of fdi policies and attractive opportunities and they are giving high amount of investments and subsidies to encourage the power sector sectors especially uh, you can see now the thermal power plants uh, are uh, are, are no mostly some most of the states they will be having the thermal power plants but if you see about the coal power plants the governments are not supportive that much because they know that in one day we they need to close down those kind of conventional power sources so the supports like uh, wind energy the so one of the major area india is going to be placed in uh, upcoming 5 to 10 years because the government already initiated the policy which is called as the offshore energy program or the offshore wind energy uh, policies so the offshore wind energy policies of course we know that we have lot of uh, potential of wind wind energy in the ocean 
so why don't we utilize that in a proper manner so the offshore wind energy policy of india uh, will be helping in many aspects especially the technological advancement the uh, creating uh, human resource or uh, uh, developing and it will be uh, adding to the G, uh, our gdp there are so many things are there and government is looking uh, in very serious manner and we will be able to see the changes in near future so these are some of the uh, just i have taken the example from the adani power uh, these are some of the expected uh, new upcoming projects in the uh, recent uh, in within uh, 10 to 15 years and we can see that these are uh, power based on the gas uh, like nafta and um, based on the thermal power plants so another area we we are having which is called the electrification in the railways so we have uh, witnessed uh, in Osmo, almost the south uh, areas are mostly uh, electrified so there also there are several opportunities we can see uh, the central organization for railway electrification this is an agency they are looking after the electrification work in the indian railways so we can see the accumulative uh, increase in uh, the electrifications and the proposed uh, lines to be electrified in the next few years. So if you see the large number of projects like example uh, companies like uh, 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 IRCON, then RITES, then case KRCL, then PGCL, Power Grid Corporation of India, then Rail uh, Nigam Limited. Uh, so like that, several companies are there. They are coming into uh, the front front to increase the electrification in the railway. So here also don't think that it's only for the electrical people, uh, the, the foundations, uh, the towers, the tower designing, the sub tower designing, the structure of peoples are required, the foundation, for the civil peoples are record, then the electrification, the mechanical, electrical, and communication are uh, there also record. So the lot of areas we need to have the focus, and the railway is one of the area. It's going to generate a huge number of opportunities in the upcoming years. So when we discuss about uh, the electrical, some of the advancement in the mechanical field also we need to discuss. So one of the major area, which is the industry 4.0, uh, we have witnessed the, uh, the slowly and st steady growth of uh, adoption of industry 4.0 in various manufacturing sector. Uh, and the interconnected machine, that is one of the area we need to uh, the near uh, nearby uh, years. We, we are going to focus on the interconnected machines, which will be able to, the machines can be operated from the uh, different locations. And the digital twins, this is a actually the, one of the booming area, which is uh, the technology, which is called the digital twin, uh, which is an, a, a physical aspect system, uh, which will be in the digital form. So whatever changes happening in the system will be vis visible from a remote location. And CAD CAM sustainability, we are uh, computer aided design, computer aided manufacturing. And the question is whether it is sustainable or not. Sustainability, the uh, whether it is eco friendly or not. So now, one more area the uh, companies they are focusing on the CAD CAM sustainability and for the printing technology in various, te uh, various area, then IoT, the industrial Internet of Things, Agile project management advances in the heating and ventilation systems so industry so it is a uh, industry 4.0 which is based on the cyber physical systems uh, that is going to be there in today because you are able to manufacture suppose you are booking a vehicle you are going to get uh, when the vehicle is going to be delivered and what process it is suppose i'm booking something uh, some furnitures i can see that what kind of process it, uh, it is there that means whether it is on the uh, manufacturing or whether it is on the dispatch so like that uh, the, in the industry also capable to do all these things because they can uh, optimize the time and or they can optimize the cost as well so another uh, in industry, they will be utilizing the big data analytics, the robotics, simulations, uh, then Internet of Things, cyber securities, additive manufacturing, 
then augmented realities these all were integrated and these are the all the building blocks of industry 4.0 and interconnected machine as i told it's a vital tool uh, in manufacturing sector uh, you will be record the interconnected uh, machine as well so the, these are digital twin uh, there's a physical asset there is a twin of that that is a digital asset and whatever things changes in the physical asset will be reflected in the digital way and you can, you you will be able to uh, changes uh, you can make uh, many changes in that system so these are called cat, cat cam sustainability and the sustainable uh, there are several uh, factors uh, like uh, reusability uh, workability recyclability or durability uh, so these factors will be this concept will be implemented in the cad cam so we have learned about a lot of things about the 3d printing why not 4d printing which is related to the external energy input the temperature light or other environmental which is called as the 4d 4d printing so the 3d printing is now to the next level which is called as the 4d printing which will be utilizing the external energy as uh, input as temperatures and self repairing pipelines uh, is the uh, one of the example for the 4d printing technology and of course the industrial uh, internet of things uh, which will be interconnected with the sensors instruments and other devices uh, and computer based systems uh, which will be helping us like building management systems uh, the similar way they are trying to implement in the industry also so wherever the remote locations you can operate it and you can control whatever devices that you want it so agile project management that is another one area which is focused uh, in the timely management as especially the mapping the optimization and application then implementation and evaluation so whatever we are doing so how efficiently you are going to do and whether we are meeting the times milestones so the agile project management will be helping because uh, we are giving some kind of kpis that are the key performance indicators uh, which will be the milestones whether we have achieved or not if we are not achieved what is the issues and try to rectify uh, in the uh, cruise loop so what will happen the conflicts the time delays in the projects uh, which we we can uh, which we can reduce in a greater manner so mega projects the tunnel dams bridge construction uh, express ways hydro projects metro construction these are one of the various kind of projects as i told in several projects uh, the all kind of people are required the civil people suppose the example of a wind projects the civil people will be required in the various uh, various stages of the projects and uh, the electrical mechanical uh, graduates also required in a lot of way and this is the example of the solar project which will be in the planning stage engineering and design stage procurement stage we require lot of uh, manpower from the various uh, areas so as i told uh, it's a very uh, broad topic to be discussed within a very few times uh, definitely uh, we'll be helping uh, in many ways uh, to acquire the skill skill sets so by this i will move uh, towards the what nikmar offers to improve the skill sets uh, in many uh, these kind of projects. So this uh, includes the overall uh, sectors and the industry overview, like uh, thirty percentage of uh, GDP from the real estate and the uh, construction and infrastructures. Right, it's a high growing industry. Uh, we can see it, and the major project for policy reformations in India. Uh, like uh, national highway development program uh, the smart city mission uh, the maritime development program which is sagarmala which is related to the ports improvements in port and most of the challenges in the projects which are based on uh, several factors uh, one of the area which is due to the delay and uh, 
on show uh, on schedule cost overrun these are some of the areas which we need to focus and there are several gaps are uh, there as per the niti aayog depo, uh, reports says need to be some sort of skills are need to be improved in a greater manner so as a career opportunity we offers or the career opportunity in various sectors for civil mechanical and electrical uh, which is uh, divided into contracts management the how the people they will be looking into the contracts the project management they will be looking into the planning scheduling and some of the work people they will be looking into project finance so how they will be managing what kind of strategies they will be utilizing then project consultancy management then some of them are uh, working on the business development commercial marketing technology development laws and regulation site administration and women management and entrepreneurship management so so the requirement of where careers from various sectors you can see the certified project management requirements are very much high so the requirements are very much high so we need to acquire several kind of uh, several kind kind of skill sets so the nikmar uh, it's um, established uh, by the con indian construction industry we are delivering the pg programs in construction real estate and crip sector uh, mainly and uh, we are have several campuses pune hyderabad ncr goa and these are some of the images from different campuses so so we have two uh, three different schools schools of construction management project real estate management and school of general management and the how you are going to acquire these kind of technical skills by acquiring the technical skills managerial skills industrial interactions and then you will be uh, converted to a techno managers uh, which are industry ready so the curriculum the the way of teaching everything will be uh, related to uh, the what industry want what kind of skill set uh, that we uh, want to acquire so these are some of the courses which is offered from different campuses uh, there are two year course one year course and several uh, weekend programs also being done so these are some of the uh, areas which we will be focusing and uh, the main advantage faculties are from multidisciplinary uh, student support pedagogy then resources so this will be helping uh, in many aspect to acquire the uh, required amount of skill set that is industry ready uh, engineers for different kind of projects our admissions are started and these are the past recruiters uh, various roles like cost management strategic management project management planning construction management our our students are being placed in these kind of uh, companies and thank you if you have any question you can kindly do visit our website which is www.nikmar.ac.in thank you thank you all thank you all for uh, being there in the meeting thank you thank you sir thank you so participants if you have any doubt uh, you can uh, carry on the questions with them sir can you explain it the 4d printing the so 4d printing which is actually uh, related to the 3d printing the advanced level of uh, 3d printing which will be the temperature also will be one part of uh, the printing technology that means when you increase the temperature according to that the shape will change okay thank you sir oh. okay uh, thank you for everyone uh, if you do, if you have any question please uh, contact us we are he here to uh answer the questions um so i think we can wind up now thank you thank you uh, vijay thank you for the opportunity
once again sir uh, i request uh, ms lokeshwari uh, finally student to present the vote of thanks yes sir yeah it's my great privilege to propose vote of thanks for this webinar we would like to thank our principal and vice principal for the continuous support and encouragement yeah. and also like to express our gratitude towards towards dr r kumuda ma'am head of the department civil engineering and mr vijay vignesh sir assistant mm -hmm. professor civil engineering for organizing such a useful webinar also thanks on behalf of the college svc a big special thanks to our speakers dr mahesh balasubramani sir and professor v vishnu nambudri sir for sharing their valuable knowledge on opportunities for civil mechanical and electrical engineers in construction management sector both of your speech gave us deep insights into the project into the topic and also revealed some interesting facts related to civil mechanical and electrical engineering we also gained an in-depth understanding of the topics like advancement in construction materials construction technology project management system mechanical and electrical projects i am pretty sure the precious knowledge that dr makesh bai subramani sir and professor v vishnu nambudri sir gave us will definitely help us in getting future opportunities once again i i would like to thank dr mahesh bai subramani sir and professor v vishnu nambudri sir for taking out the time from their busy schedule and enlightening us with the knowledge thank you so much we are expecting more opportunities to learn from both of you thank you a heartful thanks to all the staff students and participants who attended thank you all once again thank you vishnu thank you sir and uh, thank you both of you sir uh, for spending your time here put on yeah.